In the previous video, I showcased a proof of concept root exploit against Serenity OS, a bit of an obscure operating system. But at the end of that video, I shared a few thoughts why I think looking into Serenity OS and this particular exploit is not a waste of your time, and I want to expand on this with this video. To prove a point, I want to give you an example of how the Serenity OS kernel and the Linux kernel relate to each other. And we do that by looking at Ptrace. Ptrace is a syscall that basically implements the features for debugging another process. GDB, the GNU debugger, obviously uses Ptrace so you can interact with another process. Specifically, you can call Ptrace PT attach to attach a debugger or tracer to a process. With ptpeak, you can read memory from a target process. With ptpoke, you can write memory. And with ptrace single step, you can single step in a process. As I mentioned, it's the syscall to implement typical debug features like in GDB. Now that you know what ptrace does, let's compare the ptrace syscall source code of Linux and Serenity. In the excellent Linux source code code browser, Alexia, we can search for ptrace and then look out for a file that looks promising. You could click through some of the other files, but this one looks most likely, a kernel ptrace.c file. All right, now let's go find the ptrace implementation in Serenity OS. Just FYI, I'm here on the commit where the vulnerability was still present, so code might have changed in the latest version. Here we simply search for ptrace, and it turns out in the folder kernel, there's a ptrace.cpp file, but there's also a kernel syscall ptrace.cpp file. So let's look at the latter first. And here we can find a very short function, sysptrace, which very quickly calls ptrace handle syscall. When we now check out the other ptrace.cpp file, we can actually find that handle function. So here seems to be the actual implementation of ptrace. Now let's compare Linux and Serenity OS. Linux's implementation starts by checking if the request parameter is ptrace trace me. And Serenity also has a check of pt trace me. But OMG, why the heck does Serenity OS have another underscore here? I think I changed my mind about Serenity. It's literally unusable. Serenity is garbage. Just kidding, but you can see the code is similar, but different. On Linux, in this case, it calls ptrace trace. And if that doesn't return successfully, it will call arch ptrace attach instead. Otherwise, it will return via this go to. And this function ptrace trace me has a check if we are currently being traced. And Serenity has that check too. If the current process has a tracer already attached, we return ebusy. Though it looks like Linux returns eperm, so a permission error. And the Linux man page also says that eperm might be returned if the process is already being traced. So you can see slightly different implementation of the basically same thing. Now, if we look further in the code, we see that in Serenity OS, we start to have various checks. For example, it ensures that the requested ptrace process ID is not the ID of the currently calling process. Or it also has the setUID check to prevent you from tracing a root program. And here it ensures that the requested process is already traced and traced by our calling process, meaning that our calling process called pt attach before. And here's the Linux equivalent. Linux calls this function ptrace check attach, where it checks if the requested child to attach to is already being traced and if our current process is the parent of the tracy. Totally similar. But let's go on with the Linux code of the ptrace syscall, because we eventually call an architecture-specific ptrace implementation. When we click on it and look for references, we see that there is an x86, so Intel version, there's an ARM version, and tons of other processor architectures. That's the mess you have to deal with Linux. Linux supports so many different architectures, and the lower level you get, the more architecture-specific code you need to implement. Serenity does not support different architectures, but that also makes it so much easier to read for educational purposes. Now let's look into the Linux x86 version. Here you can see a big switch case statement that checks which ptrace functionality you want. Pretty much the same way how Serenity has here a switch case statement. I mean, I think I showed enough. We could go on and on comparing their code. 
as you can see, the code looks different. The way stuff is implemented is different, but it's essentially the same functionality. So I believe if you understand Serenity operating system internals, you will also understand Linux internals or at least will understand them much quicker because you already can imagine how something could be implemented. And knowing how something could be implemented is an extremely powerful skill when doing hacking or research. That's why I always recommend learning to program or reading code. So Serenity OS is not a wasted time. Serenity OS is an amazing learning resource and you can have so much fun playing and poking around the kernel sources. And please never think that a toy project is a waste of time. You can grow your skills massively being involved in something like this. And so what do we do now? We look into the Serenity OS kernel source code to understand better the exploit we looked at in the previous video. So this HXP Wisdom 2 exploit from the original challenge author abused a race condition where an unprivileged process could actually modify the code of a set UID binary in memory. But it's a race condition. So to have a successful exploit, this was only possible within a small window of time just when the new process was loaded. To understand the root cause of the vulnerability, we have to look into the kernel code of the ptrace and execve syscall. ptrace was used to write into the other processor's memory and execve was used to load the victim set UID binary. Okay, so you already saw a bit of the ptrace code before, but let's look at it again because last time the purpose was just to compare it to Linux. Now we read the code with the purpose to understand the vulnerability. So when you read code, you might want to read it differently depending on your goal. Sometimes you can ignore parts if they are irrelevant to your goal. Anyway, when you start reading here, you might find something very important near the start of this function. It checks if the target process is a set UID process. And if that's the case, the syscall returns with an access error. This is interesting because this looks safe. This looks like it should prevent anybody from using ptrace to change the memory of a set UID binary. Hmm. So I guess we should check the second part. How does execve execute a set UID program? Because ptrace had its own file, maybe execve has two. So we can use GitHub's go to file feature to search for execve and we can find the execve.cpp file in kernel syscalls. Cool. In there we can find a function that has a similar pattern like the ptrace syscall function. Here's a sys $execve function. As I mentioned, I'm reading this code with the purpose of understanding the vulnerability. So right now I'm just skimming over the code looking for any serious important function call related to this. We seem to copy around a lot of the parameters used for execve but nothing more. And at the end we see a call to the function exec. Let's follow that. Here it is. First we seem to open the program we try to execute and then we check if we try to exec a shell script with a shebang at the start or if we have an actual elf binary. In the case of our exploit where we executed the set UID binary pass wd, we should be in here. And this seems to eventually call do exec. Follow that as well. I'm still just skimming the code here, not really reading it. I'm kind of just looking out for function calls that could be important or related to the vulnerability. And all of that sounds uninteresting. Like we don't really care about the absolute path of the binary or the stack size or if profiling was enabled. But eventually we can find here a function load. With this related error message, do exec fail to load main program or interpreter. So this seems to load the binary to execute. And that sounds like one of the important functions we do care about. Hmm. Keep that load function in mind. If we skim more of the code, we see here that the effective UID and effective group ID is modified. Those variables are prefixed with M to indicate they are member variables of the current process object. So the currently running process that called execve. And now here we check if the new program is a set UID program and then we change the effective UID accordingly, setting it to root. And that's it. Do you notice the vulnerability here? If not, pause the video and think about this code for a moment. Three, two, one. Okay. We loaded the new program into memory and then afterwards we changed the effective UID of the process. Remember how ptrace checks if you are allowed to modify the memory of a process? It checks the effective UID to prevent tracing of set UID binaries. But the new program was already loaded 
before the effective UID was updated. So here is the race condition. If we can ptrace and modify the memory, write malicious shellcode into it right after the set UID binary is loaded, but before we update the EUID, then it would work. Now that we identified the potential vulnerability, we can think about a strategy to exploit it. And because it looks like a race condition, which means it might be unreliable as it has to happen in a small window, we could try to find a way to increase the time window. So let's go hunting. Basically now you want to actually look at every single code line and function that is executed in this window. And think about ways to make that code run slower. Typical strategies are of course things such as loops. If you can make a loop have more iterations, you will have a longer time window. And look at this line here, unveiledpaths.clear. Unveiled path is also a member variable, so we can check the process.h header file to figure out the type, and it is a vector of unveiled path objects. And vector is a standard C++ class, and so we can look up some information about the clear method. And according to the C++ reference, the complexity is linear to the size, so the amount of elements in that vector list. Complexity refers to the time complexity. So the clear function runs longer the more elements are in the list, which means we might have found a great candidate to slow down the race condition window. And do you remember the cliffhanger from last video? Remember the tens of thousands of paths that were unveiled by the exploit code? Now you know why. We wanted to make the size of this vector super large so that the code runs longer. Cool. Now we understood the vulnerability. <laughs> What could we do next? Should we try to find a similar vulnerability? Maybe there's another race condition. And actually, when I read over this code, I noticed this here, kill threads except self. As you know, when we call execve to execute the set UID binary, our process is of course running. So our threads are still running. And I thought, hold on a minute, kill threads except self? If we kill all threads after we loaded the binary, could we create a similar exploit? Instead of using ptrace to overwrite the newly loaded code, we just write the memory from another thread running in parallel. I got super excited. I thought now I'm also a cool hacker who can find a kernel exploit. But my joy was short. I eventually saw the code right before the load where it says, mark this thread as the current thread that does exec. Crap. But on the other hand, I wasn't sure why this would prevent other threads from running. I haven't looked into the scheduler code of Serenity OS, so I don't know why this should prevent it. So we have a choice now how to deal with this uncertainty. First, we can just believe this comment, or two, we can try to read the scheduler code, or three, we could do a small experiment. Because I'm not super good in reading and understanding low level code like the scheduler, and I wanted to believe I could find the vulnerability, I decided to do an experiment. Let's create a hacks.cpp program for that, which I place into the userland folder. Here's a minimal main method, simply printing a string. By the way, I have set up Serenity OS development environment in a Ubuntu VM. To start Serenity and then run my program, I simply call the ninja or make commands to build Serenity. And just a moment later, a chemo window will open, booting Serenity and give us a shell. And now we can execute hacks. Cool. So. I want to figure out if a thread can still be scheduled after the load of the new binary. And we can detect that kind of the same way how the exploit did it, by simply writing a sentinel value to the entry point, and then keep checking that value. So how do we create the thread? I don't remember. So I googled, see create thread. I found a website which said the function is pthread create, which I hope Serenity also has. Because I like copy and pasting code, I simply search for the Serenity sources of other userland programs using it. And with that code inspiration, I wrote my own test. Here it is, and please excuse my ugly code. First, I fork into a child and parent. The child gets the process ID of the parent, attaches to the parent, changes the entry address to a sentinel value, and then detaches again. 
it's just there to modify the entry point. The reason why I have to use ptrace to change that memory instead of just writing it directly is that the entry point is mapped, read and execute only and not writable. And I can't call mprotect on this memory area to change the permission and make it writable because the mprotect source call only works on memory ranges that were previously mmapped and not just loaded through the elf loader. At least that's how I understood the code. Figuring this out was frustrating and took me hours reading more kernel code. Ugh. Kids, read more kernel code, it's fun. Anyway, the parent then creates a thread and simply reads the value of the entry point in a loop, while the main thread of the parent simply execves a set UID binary. Here is how it looks like when executing. This is the original value at the entry point, then we ptrace from the child and change it to 414141. And then we have the thread just reading that value all the time and we exec in parallel. If my idea for an attack would work and the scheduler would still schedule this thread, then we might read the new loaded entry point again. And to artificially help my experiment, I added a few useless loops right into the kernel code where I expected the race condition. Of course, on a real target kernel, this wouldn't be the case, but just to confirm that this race condition could work, we can do that. But no matter how often I execute this test, even with an extreme slowdown from my modified kernel, it never works. I did run into several page fault errors, which I can't explain, but the experiment failed. Though I would still like to understand why this one line works. Why does this block threats from executing? And so I use a secret option four, the cheat code, asking Andreas Kling, the developer, directly. Why does the scheduler not execute this thread anymore? So the exacted is the thread ID of a thread in the current process that is attempting to perform an exec. And uh, we use that to prevent any other threads from the same process from getting scheduled by the kernel uh, while an exec is in progress because if we were to schedule any other thread in this process after we have started messing with the memory layout of this process then um, that other thread was going to get very very confused when its code is not where it's supposed to be so the mechanism is very simple uh, when we enter into exec here uh, we simply assign the current thread id to m exected and then uh, the scheduler whenever it's picking which um, thread to schedule next. If the process of the candidate thread has an exacted set, uh, then we will not schedule any other thread in that process except the exacted thread. We look through the uh, list of threads that are candidates for execution and we um, skip over any threads that uh, are not the exacted thread in a process that has an exacted. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Oh, okay, this was pretty easy. To be honest, I was kind of scared of reading the scheduler code myself. That sounded super complex to me. But I think Andreas just showed again how readable Serenity OS kernel code is. I'm a huge fan of reading source code to understand systems better. But the Linux kernel code can be very complicated, especially when you have never done it before. This C++ code and low-level CPU stuff is not easy for beginners either, but easier than Linux. And learning and reading code is always a very slow progression. So don't be scared to read code and don't worry if you don't understand it. You can always come back to it in a few months and maybe you learned enough to give it another go. Nobody's learning this stuff over a weekend. Anyway, I thought that this was interesting and I hope you do too.